I'm interested in less in 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 uh, in sort of in trying harder, which is one way to avoid errors, but not a very good way to avoid errors. Um, I'm interested in the systems components that predispose to errors, um, and how we can you know, which is actually a lot of these things, these interferences. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about um, some of these things conceptually um, that I hope will make uh, make sense to you when we talk about when we talk about them. So. Um, yeah, so what I, these are my objectives to talk about the ne oh, sorry, negatives of, uh, of system integration in spinal surgery, to, to talk about human factors um, and the science of human factors uh, and how that relates to some of these things and indeed some of these things, and think about how, what that's going to mean for the future. Um, human factors comes about really through this understanding that as we move from um, uh, from sort of uh, artisanal, um, you know, artisanal, uh, you know, sort of one-off processes to uh, to complex uh, technological processes. Um, that as we increase the technical complexity, we need to be thinking about the individuals doing the work. Um, you know, we've got huge numbers of that. And so it came from the sort of scientific management of Taylor Gil, Br and Gil Breath, from which we get things like um, time and motion studies, but also things like how do we get people on production lines um, to, to all do the same thing? And how do we, when we, when we started to design aircraft, to be, the, which were incredibly complex, how do we design them so that the people flying them can use them um, with without having to spend huge amounts of time and money for any of these groups on things like training. Um, because when we have to spend lots of time and money on training, um, in, uh, then it might suggest that we could design the system better in the first place. Um, and so this came about through increasing use of, uh, of technologies, which requires much more skill. Um, you know, when we have an automated process, um, we need to be able to do the original process. So, you know, this came, so if we think about flying planes or doing surgery, um, we need to be able to do the basic surgery before we can then use the automation. So our skill set when we introduce technology increases much more. Um, uh, and, and it also comes about when we want to do more of this that we want to get more people in. So we need to have, so we've got huge numbers of people, cost constraints. And actually, if we do this, um, if we design the world around the people doing the work, then it gets us a competitive advantage because it will get us uh, efficiencies and all those sorts of things. And I'm going to talk about this in a little bit more detail as we go through. However, um, my example uh, of, of this illustration is which phone would you use? Phone one, which does calls, text, email, music, photo, web, GPS, has a three-day battery life, and is $100. Of phone two, that does calls, text, email, music, photo, web, GPS, and has a one-day battery life and costs $500. Which one would you, which one would you select? <laughs> well, you would select one, wouldn't you? But then, in that case, you can have my old Nokia N95, <laughs> which has all these wonderful functions, but is gar was garbage to use because it was so difficult to use. So the point here is around functionality, what something does, versus usability. How can you actually do it? And a lot of things we've been talking about relate to this, that it's not just about having a technology that can navigate accurately. It's how difficult it is it to be able to, to access that level of, uh, of accurate accuracy in navigation that makes the difference. Um, and often we design our devices to look like this, and we don't think about this. Um, by the way, any time that, you know, and this is a, a, an example I used to think about how we buy equipment in, in hospitals in general, that the people using it simply look at what it can do um, rather than actually testing it with a, you know, to see how usable it is. So that's an example of how if we design things with the human in mind, it can open up the functions of technology to be more accessible, to require less training, to be much more accurate, and to be, error, you know, to be much less prone to error. Um, OK, um, and actually, then we, when we extend this idea to the whole system, um, we've got people in the middle who are us, and we can't change us very much. But we can think about what they do, the technologies that they're using, the environment that they're working in, and the organization that they're working for. And all of these things are interacting all the time, but they all, all alter our own individual performance. So we can think about, uh, so if we're having problems with tasks, we can think about rearranging or, or reorganizing tasks. 
I've talked about the design of technology. The rooms in which we do things, or the, the space in which we do things, or the lighting um, where we do them, um, in, indeed the heat and the noise that we do them in, have in, impact on our, um, on our performance. Of course, with, uh, with increasing surgical technology, we need bigger and bigger operating rooms to, um, to incorporate that check technology. And, indeed, and if we don't think about that, we become more and more cramped, which has impact on our performance. And then the organisation, of course, has all sorts of impacts, particularly things like if we, uh, if we, increase, the, you know, if we increase the use of surgical technology, we need to be organising uh, rosters of OR staff so that we make sure that the experienced ones in, in the use of our particular surgical technology are available today to operate on the list. We need to be thinking about training them and we need to think, be thinking about developing all of their skills as well. So these are the organisational impacts that technology can have, or all these other things can have, on our ability to do the job. Um, and if we only focus on, uh, on individuals and individual training and all this wonderful stuff, which is important, but if we only focus on that, then we'll forget about all these other things that are, in the, that are creating the performance effects that we see in the operating room. Um, the other component of this is about work as imagined versus work as done. Work as imagined is how we think the world works. Now, you guys are you know, familiar with the realities of operating rooms. Lots of people aren't, and including a lot of equipment designers. Um, this is what a work as imagined looked like, and it looks like no, uh, no operating room that I've ever seen, nor probably ever will see. It's, you know, it's a nice manufacturer's, uh, you know, ma manufacturer's photo. You know, uh, unrealistic, sorry. This, this is more what an operating room looks like, and this is more what people in operating rooms actually do, is things like, we've got all these power cables, and how do we move all this equipment around with these power cables, you know, going un underneath and around everywhere. So this creates, so this is the difference, yeah, so this is where work is imagined and work was done. When we work in this space, the world seems simple, and if only people did what they should do, then everything would be fine. But actually, the world is like this. Um, and so the ideal is we can have protocols and checklists. Well, they don't, uh, they don't account for every eventuality. That we can standardise work, we can to a certain extent, but you know what another name for rule breaking is? Innovation. Innovation, thank you, exactly. So, uh, so you know, saying we should always stick to the rules is, is neither correct nor is it des desirable. Um, Evidence-based. Well, a lot of what we do, we think we like to do evidence-based pra practice. Well, actually, it's kind of rare that we have evidence-based practice. A lot of it is more like socially constructed. Uh, and indeed, people don't change their behavior based on evidence. They change their behavior based on emotional responses to the evidence. Um, <clears throat> Uh, you know, we think that training is effective. Well, we know that there's a there's a dis, you know there's often uh, a, a, dis, a disjoint between how we train and actually what we do. You know that thing of you know the first time you you uh, you know you uh, uh, you start work somewhere, people say, oh well, you've got to forget everything you trained. Here's how here's how it's going to work in my operating room. Um, and indeed, you know, uh, hospitals themselves like to write loads and loads and loads and loads of policies that are unknowable because there are too many of them, unknown because, you know, how do we know whether there's a policy for this or that or the other? Um, unavailable because we don't have access to the policy right now that says how we should do things, and unrealistic because we will have a 30-page policy, for, you know, for a, for a task that might take two minutes. Um, and so, so we've got to think about all these different ways in which the, the, the sort of the system of surgery um, you know, helps us or doesn't help us to deliver the care in which, you know, that we want to deliver. Rather than only focusing on us as individuals, thinking about all these different things and how these things relate. And of course, there's a lot of research now that's been directed specifically at people standing, people like me standing in operating rooms, seeing the challenges that people like you guys have um, in, uh, in, in delivering the safe, efficient care that you want to deliver. Um, <clears throat> this is another um, reflection of this work as imagined versus work as done, specifically focused on technology. This is something we hear, I, I've heard a lot of. Our technology is great, but you know, the thing is, people just won't use it. Well, that's because work as imagined is that a new thing will lead to better behavior, 
which will lead to better performance, which will reduce costs or improve outcomes. Right? This is an imaginary way of thinking about any particular technology, because the technology has to be usable. It has to be used appropriately. It has to be reliable. It has to fit into normal workflow. What that thing does, it must be accessible, must be understandable, must inform decision making, lead to a change in behavior that leads to better performance. And that better performance relates to the thing that you want to change. So, so we've got to be very careful about understanding the relationship between the technologies we introduce and actually the outcomes that it might or might not create. You know, people who sell technology tell us these stories, and it's really, really, it can be really, 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 uh, um, uh, you know, we, 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 it's very attractive, but it's not always true. And I uh, when when we when I worked at Cedars, we used to have. And in fact, I still do this. We have sort of every so often all these great people, you know, from uh, great minds, technology developers coming in saying, hey, I've got an idea for this. And sometimes I've had to turn them away because their, their understanding of, of actually how this is their great idea, which seems nice on paper and they might have a great elevator pitch for, doesn't actually fit into anything like the clinical workflow that one sees um, in normal clinical practice. OK, so, um, so let's get on to some of the stuff that, uh, that Danielle and uh, Dr., uh, Dr. Kim and Dr. Johnson were, um, uh, that we worked together on um, looking at image-guided spinal surgery in the OR arm. Um, the sort of measure we use to look at these mismatches between what we're asking people to do and what, they, what actually happens in the operating room is called flow disruptions. Um, and so the first thing about this is that, that actually, so these are the sort of different phases. This is pre o arm this is preparation of the o arm this is O-arm spins, this, this is screws. So, so actually putting in the screws there was, was the most disrupted part of this particular task. Um, and then if we look at what those disruptions were, um, is this, oh, sorry. Ooh. So if you look at what these disru disruptions were, it's a lot of coordination issues. This is around teamwork, because when you have big pieces of equipment that rely on lots of people to do lots of things at once, um, you, you require them to all coordinate. And so, um, so if you're reliant on that, then obviously it's, it's easy for those things not to happen. Um, and if we looked at, um, uh, and, and the equipment issues were also significant, and I'm going to uh, talk a little bit more about those in this. Um, so the coordination flow disruptions are prim primarily caused by staff absences. I think it's down here somewhere. Well, uh, certainly assistants and all those sorts of things. And these anesthesia delays. Um, so um, uh, so this, is the, this is in starting to call for and starting to use, uh, wanting to use the O-arm of people not being available in the right place at the right time. Um, but it's also uh, problems with, with, with instruments, instrument availability. Um, <clears throat> equipment problems, uh, in this case, are primarily caused by camera and calibration problems. Um, so these are, the, again, these are the things that stop the team and stop the process and have to be resolved. So this says to me that there's probably, there's probably a better way to design this, or we should be thinking about better ways to design this. One of our speakers said earlier that what we want is something invisible. Uh, and indeed, I was intrigued by the, 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 the light camera and the... Um, the uh, um, uh, can be, uh, the, the machine vision, which is, a, again, this, this idea of actually if we can make the process invisible, um, then that's going to be a much better way than all these, you know, all, all these really you know, sort of clunky ways of doing things. Um, <clears throat> we also found that a bex, um, a, an expert, expert surgeons are better at coordination, not just surgical spills, but coordinating the team than novice surgeons. An expert surgeon will recognize the value of actually getting everyone involved um, to be on the same page before starting. Um, and an expert IDS tech, tech is better at coordination and the management of the equipment. So we found actually there was a summative that if we have an expert sur an, a servant surgeon who's expert in the use of uh, the O-arm, or, a, uh, or an expert IGS tech, they would have these benefits that meant the operation was much smoother. By the way, this is summative, um, that if you have both an expert surgeon and an expert IGS tech, um, those things improve again. Um, so using this sort of method of direct observation, we can start to look at, well, what are the system components that we might play around with to help us improve our efficiency and our safety and the accuracy of what we do and reduce all these frustrations?
Um, we can also think about, um, and so, we, you know, um, teamwork is this sort of nebulous thing that, that there's lots of wishy-washy stuff over. I'm interested in, uh, in actually the structures and how we, how we, go, we go about structuring teamwork and process. Um, some early work I did um, looked at how we could, how we could uh, use things like how we could learn from pit stops about handoffs. And the same thing works here. If everyone, um, you know, rather than relying on everyone to know what they should, uh, to, to, um, if you, rather than <laughs> communicating, um, you know, sort of non-specifically to everyone, if there's a, tar if, if we know what sequence um, uh, of, if we know the sequence of the tasks that need to be performed and, and we know who needs to perform them, um, then we're going to start getting better at doing, doing all these complex things at once. So thinking about not only leadership and involvement and briefings and huddles and checklists, but task and role allocation, who does what when, and task sequence. In what sequence do we do all of these things? That we can start actually to engineer the process, not just from a technological point of view, but from a human systems point of view too. Um, <clears throat> so <clears throat> I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm getting on. So using this sort of framework, we can start to think about some of the issues associated with uh, spinal surgery technology that we're going to think about now, but we're also going to need to think about increasingly in the future, the more technology we start to introduce, because, it, because technology is only going to increase the complexity of, uh, well, it is mostly going to increase the complexity of what we want to do. So let's start with the individual skills, um, both for the surgeon, but also the rest of the team. Um, teamwork and communication, which changes um, whether you're, you, you know, depending on what you're doing. The teamwork in a cardiac operation looks fundamentally different to teamwork in an orthopedic operation or to teamwork in a spinal operation. And the introduction of different surgical, uh, you know, spinal technologies is going to change what a good team looks like. Um, and then we need to, you know, we need to think about these dedicated roles. Um, you know, do we need, um, you know, how, how much benefit, what's the cost benefit of having an IGS tech, for example? Um, think about workload distribution, who does what? The, the, as, we, as we increase the technology, we increase the requirements and other people to also be involved in the work. I, I'm doing, I've recently published um, in uh, looking at the DaVinci robot, and really one of the features there, and we find it here, is that if you, when you introduce this technology, you turn a normal scrub tech from somebody sort of hands instruments to, to the surgeon to somebody who needs to know, who's more like a technician, who needs to know how the, how the technology works and how, what they, what, you know, how their knowledge of te technology fits into the overall flow of the process and how it's designed. Um, we can think about role allocation, who does what, and indeed the challenges at different, uh, in different phases of the surgery, um, because all of that helps us to understand, right, who do we need and what, we need, what do they need to do at this time and this moment. Um, we need to say, with technology, you know, I'm not, I, 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 I sort of joke when I say, you know, if there's one technological, um, I, I'm working with a bunch of architects on, on OR design, and the first thing I've said to them is, how do we get power? You know, how do we do, deal with the problem of power leads in the operating room? You know, it's not, it's this simple thing, but, but has such big impacts on, on, uh, on, on all sorts of work system processes that it's nice to have all these million dollar, uh, you know, million dollar pieces of equipment, but if we can't plug them in or can't recharge them or they go, they go down because we can't get power to them, you know, that's, that's sort of useless. Um, uh, as I said, we want to think about functionality and usability. Um, uh, the OR size and layout, I've mentioned that. How will staff move around the operating room once, it's, uh, you know, once we have all these technologies in, in it? And indeed, um, the fact that we, um, the fact that we, um, we rel often rely on, understand, on, on seeing what each other are doing, seeing the eyes of each other to understand how we're thinking, that the sight lines um, uh, and how, how technology can affect those are important. They're going to affect our, our performance as well. And then thinking about um, the ORs in which we're working. Are they big enough? Are we always able to use a certain, you know, certain types of ORs? Thinking about staff ro rosters, you know, making sure that we've got the right people with the right skills in the right place at the right time and team familiarity so all of those things um, come sort of stem from this idea that once we buy a piece of technology we need to be thinking about all these different things if we want to optimize its use um, so the future for, for spinal surgery 
is the challenge is how we deal with this increase in complexity. We all, I think we all agree that with the right, you know, with the right, addressing the right challenges, we can have some real benefits. But we need to think about these things. We need to think about how new technologies and treatments create this uh, complexity, how we deal with this complexity in all these different ways. Um, <clears throat> And indeed, um, uh, and I think the solution is to how, how we reduce the unnecessary complexity, standardization of environment, technology and tools, improved error-proof designs, better interfaces, um, improved training and pr procedures, not just focusing on surgeons, but focusing on, on both teamwork and individual other team members. Um, and yeah, and indeed, um, how we can understand, model and predict that early, rather than introducing a technology into an operating room and then suddenly being faced with all these problems. I think there are better ways to, uh, to, uh, to predict that in the future. Thank you so much.